think that if we can find more examples <coughs> like, the, uh, like the Bush Holly House and what they've done, uh, then we can inspire those others out there uh, in possession uh, of such property to to come up to the to this standard. And what I'm what I'm finding out, you know, with this slave dwelling project is, you know, when you look along the rivers. Uh, where one plantation ended, another began, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. That that just just repeated itself. And you know, if 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 your neighbor did well, and your neighbor has a nice house, and he had a good crop, uh, you know, you're going to try to equal that. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of times, you would overextend, and when you overextend, your property has to go. And this, this of course, the slaves got caught up. The cabin was very close to the house, so chances are that slave was privileged in that manner. Uh, it it might have, uh, don't know the dynamics of relationship between the slave owner and that particular slave that lived in that house. Um, but it, it, if you look at those artifacts, you would say that there was some privilege there. Mm -hmm. um, it just, that could be told through those artifacts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's why it's important. To, you know, to save these places because uh, they help tell the story. Absolutely. They help tell the story, and again, I, I, the fact that they weren't these people were not paid, they were impressed into this <coughs> service. It was it was weird and sad to see um, slaves that had been sold for death um, by my uh, the state of my ancestor James Wise in Louisiana, and how some of them actually came back after having been sold to other people, came back to the sheriff's sale and bought bought things little things that were like mementos. And again, I mean, people ask me, why, um, why would you, why would anybody care about this? I have that, that has been a question. Why would you care? Well, very these, these house, these, these dwellings were the engine uh, that permitted that, the big house to run, permitted it to even exist. Mm -hmm. Because I know this personally from the inventories that my ancestors Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have had all those pretty things. Sugar tongs and side saddles and 12 embroidered chairs and carpets and all this stuff and lived in the house. I was thinking that um, since my ancestry in terms of slaveholding is only here in the north and in Connecticut and Rhode Island and Massachusetts was like this is this is the experience that my my white ancestors would have been downstairs or they would have been yes. in another part of the house. Mm -hmm. Which for me, I, I, I've been to southern plantations, I've been on tours and things, and my people didn't live in those big houses, they lived in houses like this. And folks were in the attic, or they were in the basement, or they were in the shed on the outside. And, um, so I sat here listening, trying to, in, in between the trucks rolling down Route 95, particularly listening to the rain. Yes. And imagining that that sound is the same, the same way it sounded. Trying to trying to imagine the rhythms of life of the people. Greenwich in the 1700s would have the houses would have not been right on top of each other. They would have been like scattered all over yeah. the countryside. And not everybody here in this community, as other New England communities, were slaveholders. And so I imagine for Africans who were uh, enslaved here, the unbelievable isolation that they experienced from their own community, where the, the next person who was enslaved might have been six miles by horse ride away. And what, 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 what would that have been like to have come from, in some cases, from Africa directly, if not from the West Indies up to, the, to New England, um, and not have any community of people? Um, and maybe in church on Sunday, where folks were put up in the, the, the yeah. balconies, it was the only other time, perhaps, when you saw other people who were like you. And they may not have spoken the same language or dialect. <coughs> So I, to me, I, I've had moments of imagining just the incredible isolation. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My great, my great, great grandfather placed an ad when he uh, was getting rid of his plantation. He had 59 slaves, and he called them acclimated. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so that means they've gotten used to Louisiana's heat, the climate, and right. they've they've had time to be seasoned. That really struck me, acclimated, because I, I was like. What are they acclimated like to? Like they've been yeah, well, well, seasoned more in the southern use uh -huh. of that. Uh -huh. 
uh, was bringing them in from the islands right, right. Um, so that they can apply their skills that they had already been doing in the islands to a sugarcane plantation in Louisiana mm -hmm. or if they would have been working whatever cotton whatever or rice plantations uh, rice, in South Carolina uh, yeah. are, are bringing them to that particular area and imply, applying it there after they've been in the islands mm -hmm. I brought with me last night a list of all the names that I know um, of people that my people enslaved, both in um, Connecticut and in the South. And uh, I wanted to experience what it was like, particularly for um, the uh, what my northern, how my northern ancestors um, housed the people who uh, did so much for them and um, felt a great sense of, of understanding and peace. And, um, if Bush Ho Holly House could talk this morning, I, um, I think it would, uh, there would be voices, uh, particularly in the, in the slave quarters, um, of uh, perhaps astonishment of what took place last night. But I think uh, uh, certainly a, a, a sense of uh, um, pride and certainly of, uh, um, I think of, of joy that the voices of those people uh, are recognized and honored and their lives are recognized and honored and remembered. That was state number 31 for me here in the Bush Holly House here in Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, my second stay in the North and it was interesting for me here last night because I stayed here with uh, the two descendants of slave owners which was a first. Uh, we also had a young lady up there staying uh, sharing the experience with us, Dion, uh, who's African-American like myself. Um, so it was it was quite interesting uh, in that sense uh, and um, I know that my writings uh, when I sit down to write about this, it's, it's going to be uh, quite interesting uh, because uh, a lot of times when I tell folks about my intent uh, with this project overall and more uh, specifically about places up north, I, I get a, a look of astonishment because uh, they tend to think that slavery did not exist in this region of our country, but I often tell them that um, we cannot give the North a pass because it, it existed here also. It's just that it did not take a civil war to uh, make the rest of the nation realize that slavery was not a good thing to uh, continue to do uh, as, as Americans uh, if these United States were to prosper. If these walls could talk at Bush Holly House, I, I think that they would uh, talk about uh, its, its beginnings, its, uh, how it, it endured, how it was threatened by Interstate 95, and how uh, it's open for folks to come in and in, interact with it, uh, still a living, breathing place. And it would talk about what, uh, what it, it experienced last night. Um, all the, uh, the, the, the movement that was here last night that uh, is uncommon at that time uh, of night when the doors closed to the public there was still action here and uh, the people that were here and, and the intent uh, their intent uh, I think it would be proud it would, it would let us know that it's proud that it could, it could be a part of of telling the story telling the American story so that's why I'm glad the, uh, the Bush Holly House gave me the opportunity uh, to stay here. And I'm glad that they, uh, someone uh, in his past had the wherewithal to know that uh, uh, what's upstairs is, is, is valued and it should be valued. It's, it's a part of the American story. And uh, this place does it well. You know, you can come and, and, and visit the, the front of the house uh, where the enslavers stayed. And you can go right upstairs and see where the enslaved 
and staying. So those are somewhat intimate settings. There was certainly some trust there. So the dynamics were, were, were quite unique. And to be up there last night uh, and, to, and to chat with the uh, other three who were there with me uh, was, was quite interesting. Uh, the conversation continued this morning. Uh, and uh, we actually, I, 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 in a setting where we were comfortable talking about the, the matter of slavery. Uh, and I think if we can extend this, uh, take to other places, make other people a part of this conversation, uh, it would be a good thing. So hopefully in the future, uh, this project can help do that. Bush Holly House is one of Greenwich's oldest homes. It was built in the 1730s, um, lived in by three generations of the Bush family and at least three generations of slaves. And we're just delighted that we're still able to tell that story, not only uh, of its early history, but also its later uh, life as an art colony. We have almost 4,000 children who come through Bush Holly House who take tours, to learn about slavery. And that's very important because most children don't know that slavery existed here in the north. Well, this was the original roof line when the slaves were here. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it doesn't have all this space and there was no windows. It was a very, it was an airless, um, you know, except for the heat coming up from the kitchen, no heat, um, no light to speak of. So you were talking about a roof line. This was a very cramped space. It's not this very airy because when we bring we bring children into the house and of course we introduce them into the to the concept of slavery and talk about the difference you know um, between you know what is a slave is it the same as a servant and and then they see the space and we ask them would you like to stay here it looks it looks fun enough you know <laughs> but you know we try to give them give them the perspective that this wasn't a, really a fun space. You know, and they get it very quickly. I, you know, we do bring them through that process that these people didn't make decisions to stay in bed because they didn't feel well or they, they didn't have a choice. They had to do what they were told. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for coming.